Thanks, Aaron. And we'll get started. Um, I think all of us are aware how important reproduction is for the beef industry, and maybe sometimes we don't think of just animals breeding, but also when they breed as being very important to the industry. And I've, uh, to illustrate that, I've taken some records from uh, some steers we've feed out here at North Platte from the Goodmanson Ranch and characterized them by when they were born and in the calving period, the first, second, or third cycle, and obviously animals born early are going to be heavier at weaning. Um, some maybe less obvious things are feedlot performance wasn't different. Carcass weights were greater. Marbling scores were greater. And overall profitability of those animals born early versus late in the third cycle are much greater. If we look at the heifers <clears throat> characterized by when they were born, um, interestingly, there was very little difference in gain at any point we looked at, but they were heavier at weaning, heavier pre-breeding. We had more cycling and uh, higher pregnancy rates and more calved in the first 21 days. So this event um, of when animals calve within the breeding season is, is very important to both the steer and heifer progeny, but maybe most importantly is, is uh, what it does for the cow those cows that calve early in the calving season have a much less chance of failing to breed than those that calve later. And from an economic standpoint, it's been said that uh, it takes a profit from two early calving cows to cover the loss of one late calver. And a cow that calves her entire eight or nine year life in the first 21 days of the calving period will produce one and a half to two more calves. And we, we certainly have some powerful tools to increase that, and that's what I want to talk about today, uh, increase the percent that calve early. So one of the biggest benefits probably of an AI program, which is not used widely in the beef industry in the United States, but is that those animals are actually synchronized. The number one reason producers uh, don't use AI or ester synchronization is time and labor, and hopefully today I can show you some protocols that might minimize uh, time and labor um, requirements. And if we look to the south of us, though, there is a lot of uh, um, AI, and part of that probably is t to do with labor. But in Brazil, these numbers aren't exactly uh, current, but I think the magnitude of difference between the US and Brazil is still there. So there's a lot more AI in other countries, and even currently that we're using in the United States. Now, if we think about synchronization, we have two things to consider, synchronizing estrus, but also synchronizing ovulation, which has been kind of some uh, newer uh, protocols to, to allow some very effective timed AI programs, which involves managing that developing follicle. A lot of times we think of uh, <clears throat> reproduction in the cow only involving this part of the, the cow where, where pregnancy uh, is established and and fetal development occurs, but we also need to understand there's a whole host of hormones that are important for reproduction to occur. And I know it's uh, it's cut off in the, in this slide, but if we at the very top up here at the hypothalamus, this is where GnRH is released that starts the whole cascade of events um, from the pituitary releasing hormones that act on the ovary to call follicular growth, cause follicular growth and development, and ovulation. And then we have a CL form on the ovary. And if an animal is not pregnant, the uterus secretes prostaglandin, which causes, causes regression of the CL. And a lot of times we get questions about why don't different size animals require different dosages of some of these reproductive hormones like GnRH and prostaglandin. Well, ultimately, it's not that shot that you're actually giving the cow that causes um, luteal regression or ovulation. It's starting the whole cascade of events, such as starting the uh, release of endogenous prostaglandin from the uterus that actually that actually causes luteolysis. If we if we go into a random group of cows, we really don't know what's on that ovary because we don't ultrasound those animals, and we could have a have an ovary that has a very new new corpus luteum. And uh, you know, a small follicle is illustrated here, or we could have a group of animals that are cycling well that have a mature corpus luteum that would respond very well to just.
prostaglandin. But again, that's a challenge in developing these systems is we don't know what stage of their cycles, cycle that they're, a group of cows are in. If they're in the early stage of the cycle, we don't have a CL that's responsive to prostaglandin in this period, and then we have a CL form that's responsive to prostaglandin somewhere out here around day six, <clears throat> and then we get luteal regression occurring because of endogenous um, prostaglandin release from the uterus, and then we have animals that are that are coming in heat normally, so or just naturally, so we don't know um, what if the protocol did uh, as far as these animals because they were cycling anyway. Then we have what's going on here, and we'll get more into that, but with, with estrogen, these two blips of estrogen occurring during the, during the cycle as well. And what's going on there is, um, is what I alluded to earlier that's been kind of an advance in our synchronization protocols is to control this process of follicular waves. And we see here, and you saw those two, two spikes of estrogen, but they're because of the follicular waves. We have a a small pool of follicles <clears throat> that develop until one follicle becomes dominant because of the high progesterone levels in this animal that that follicle will regress and die but then another pool is recruited and we get dominance again until we ultimately get ovulation with this follicle because because it over well we, because progesterone is then is then dropping because of uh, because of prostaglandin release from the uterus. So we have all these things going on in a set of animals that we're trying to synchronize. And some of the tools we have, um, are some of them are obvious, I think, but prostaglandins, several products on the market, Ludolice, Estermate, Esterplan, Prostamate, InSync. <clears throat> some have different dosages, but I think from the literature, all are effective luteolytic agents. The progesterone. Uh, we have MGA, which is an orally active progestin, melangestyl acetate, and then we have the CEDAR, which is a, an intrauterine device that, that has progesterone embedded into, into the device. <clears throat> and then GNRH products, uh, Cistrel and Factrel, Fertigil, Ovacyst, which I'm not sure Ovacyst or, or Prostamate have been manufactured in the last several years, so you may not have seen those <clears throat> from... Uh, I guess Teva is the company now. And then we used to have some estrogen compounds, but there are no there are no approved estrogens for use in, in beef cattle. So we don't even want to talk about those. But one of the things when people and there's still some in the world that use estrogens and think they're a wonderful thing, but because of the amount of uh, estrus response you get, part of that is though due to estrogens injected to an animal will actually cause estrous behavior, but won't necessarily cause ovulation. And that's somewhat misleading as far as the use of those compounds, um, as far as their effectiveness. And I think the literature would indicate GnRH is a much more effective hormone at causing ovulation, which is really what we want to have occur than, than the estrogens do. So if we just look back at some of the development of some synchronization programs from um, just managing the corpus luteum, you know, prostaglandin is a very good, good tool if you have animal cycling. And this this protocol still is being used some today. It's so quite labor intensive, but basically you heat check and breed for five days, and then give a shot of prostaglandin, and then continue to heat check and breed in this system. It's cheap. It's easy to administer. Cows have to be cycling. It doesn't induce estrus, and it doesn't allow for timed insemination. One step beyond that might be the two-shot prostaglandin, and this is a bit of a variation from from the original protocol, which was uh, 10 or 11 days apart, but it's been demonstrated that placing these shots 14 days apart is better um, because we have animals in later luteal phase when we're given the second shot of prostaglandin. So again, you just give everything a shot here, and then you give everything a shot here. You don't detect estrus in between or or anything, and it's relatively easy and cheap. Cows have to be cycling again. It won't induce estrus and does not allow for timed insemination. So the next set of protocols <clears throat> came about when we began to learn about follicular waves that were going on during the during the estrus cycle, and they involved GnRH, which 
gonadotropin releasing hormone I showed you in that earlier slide causes causes ovulation if a follicle is big enough. So we give GnRH followed then seven days later with prostaglandin, where if you cause ovulation here, you should have a mature enough CL seven days later that <clears throat> we would uh, prostaglandin would would uh, cause luteolysis. So then there have been a host of uh, protocols developed using GnRH, and some of them get confusing, but they all have this sink in them, but they're basically GnRH followed seven days later by prostaglandin, and then what happens after that really characterizes each of these systems. The off sink not used in beef cattle um, <clears throat> because uh, a, a variation has been uh, has been shown to be equally effective, but used quite a bit in dairy. So off sync involves GnRH two days after prostaglandin, and then the next day to breed on a, uh, to AI with a co sync. And I think some of this work was demonstrated at Colorado State. They found that um, <clears throat> giving the GnRH injection at the time of AI two days after prostaglandin or 48 hours was equally effective as running those animals through the chute again. And then the select sync, we have, uh, again, a variation of this where it's not a time breed program, but it involves heat checking. And you will have early heats in this system. So if you're going to heat check, you need to heat check at least a day or two ahead of the prostaglandin shot. But as I mentioned, <clears throat> not all phases, stages of the ester cycle are, is there a is there a follicle that will be responsive to GnRH? And we see here in these blue bars that if you give a shot in an animals at any of those stages, they won't, they won't respond to GnRH. So that's, that's a challenge in incorporating this uh, into a, a synchronization system that some animals are not responsive. The next <clears throat> device we have that's been uh, uh, widely used now is the Cedar, which is, uh, again, it's a T-shaped device that contains progesterone, and this is inserted into, into the um, vagina of the animal. And um, I know protocols, this just to, uh, for your information, I guess, we'll talk about, you know, putting these in and then trimming the tails afterwards. I found that just cut the tails off before you ever put them in, or cut them off within a couple inches, and and they end up back at the at the opening anyway within minutes. But so the <clears throat> approved protocol was to insert the cedar and then seven day or then seven days later remove it, but to give prostaglandin a day before removal. Okay, that makes sense. Now that's not what's widely being used. Have found that given prostaglandin when you remove the cedar works well. What the rationale behind this giving the giving the prostaglandin a day before is you start if there's a CL there you start luteal regression before you remove the cedar, and progesterone clearance from the cedar happens pretty rapidly as as opposed to luteolysis or the breakdown of the corpus luteum and that progesterone being cleared. If we look at how this works, here's a random group of animals now cycling. Uh, these are cycling animals. But we see uh, <clears throat> one group that is not responsive to prostaglandin up here because they have a CL that's too immature. And then we have a group that is, should be half the animals. And then we have these, as I pointed out, just a different way that are coming into heat anyway. So the protocol was really designed that we put the cedar in, <clears throat> and then seven days later remove it, but that forces or pushes these non-responsive cows into a point where they are responsive to prostaglandin, and it holds these animals that would have been cycling anyway, where we end up in a situation where all the animals theoretically should be responsive to prostaglandin when we pull that, pull that cedar. I mentioned the early heats in this co-sync protocol. Well, if you put a cedar in during this time, you're not going to get these early heats because the progesterone will, will keep animals from cycling. 
and where we time breed at 48 hours with the CoSync protocol. There have been several studies done to titrate when you breed with the uh, CoSync cedar, and it looks like it's sometime after that. And I'll give you more specifics as far as timing on some protocol sheets that we'll go over. So if we look at the heifer protocols, and we break down, and I'm going to give you a website where you can find these protocols. You can find more information on the ester cycle if you want to study up on that. And also some other proceedings papers I'll refer to later. So um, we've broken the protocols down to heat detection, heat detect, and then time breed a cleanup timed AI or a strict timed AI. And I'm part of a reproduction task force, as is Larry Rowden, who's, I believe, on that uh, meet annually to discuss, is there new research out there that would justify recommendation of a new protocol? Um, used to be there were tons of protocols that uh, a lot of people didn't have much data behind. And, and as a group, we've gotten the, the uh, AI industry to agree to just stand behind these protocols that are proven by science. So again, we still have this one-shot <clears throat> prostaglandin program where we heat check and breed for a period and then give a shot of prostaglandin and then continue to heat check and breed. We went over that. Um, you can let the bull do this. I've got several ranches that will turn the bull in for five or six days and then give a shot of prostaglandin to everything <clears throat> and then AI on the, those animals. Seven-day cedar. If you're going to heat check, probably uh, probably not a lot of benefit of giving GNRH up front, but just cedar in, cedar out seven days later with prostaglandin. And then the MJ prostaglandin program has been a really proven protocol that still stands up very well. It's inexpensive. It works really well. One uh, variation that has occurred over time is when you give this shot after you quit feeding MJ. So we're feeding MJ for 14 days. <clears throat> And then we give a shot of prostaglandin 19 days later. The original protocol was 17 days. Turns out these animals are in the later luteal phase when we give prostaglandin, and that corpus luteum is more responsive. It works really well. We use that every year here at the North Platte. <clears throat> so if we want to look at uh, protocols that allow for a minimum amount of heat detecting followed up by a timed AI. Again, we have the cedar with GNRH. Seven days later, um, prostaglandin removed the cedar. Heat check and breed for you know three or four days, and then mass breed anything that hasn't hasn't been bred. Now, we'll tell you though, if those animals are in standing heat when you go to breed them, this GNRH shot does not do any good. So, if you have a a rub patch or whatever, and we'll talk a little bit about estrus detection aids when you go to time breed given GNRH isn't going to improve your prey grades. MJ prostaglandin with timed AI. So we're same protocol as before, but we heat check and breed for a period and then do a cleanup timed AI. And then this 14-day cedar program, which if you can't get animals, or if you can't get MGA into animals, some really encouraging data with this protocol. And I've been heifers, it, the Missouri data has been very, uh, very positive with the 14-day, probably better than the seven-day cedar. But again, this involves cedar 14 days, a 16 days later prostaglandin. Now, <clears throat> that's different than the interval up here. Animals will clear progesterone from a cedar more rapidly than they do with MGA. So pay attention to all the times, because they're not different. They're not uniform, and cows and heifers are different. Here's a strict timed AI program with GNRH prostaglandin, 54-hour timed AI. MGA, it's 72 hours. And the cedar's even different as well, 66 hours with timed AI. Again, recommendations if you can't get MGA into animals, this 14-day cedar probably <clears throat> probably going to give you the best results. And again, their cost and labor is uh, outlined on these sheets, just characterized by low and high. And, and generally, as we uh, decrease labor, perhaps cost goes up. Cow protocols, um, again, broken out by heat check. And here we have the select sink with GNRH 
seven days later prostaglandin, but again, you're going to get early heats. Put a cedar in those animals, you don't get early heats. This PG six day cedar, this might be new to a lot of you. It's it's new to me too, but uh, George Perry did quite a bit of work in in South Dakota with it, and it results look pretty encouraging. Um, giving giving prostaglandin. And then three days later, GnRH and the cedar, and then six days later, prostaglandin and cedar removal. And the thought behind this is, um, some of these animals that have a CL when you're when you're putting a cedar in, you know, they may it may cause, in addition with the cedar, it may cause persistent follicles. So there might be some advantage in getting rid of that corpus luteum before you put the cedar in. It's another trip through the chute. It's somewhat of a hard sell, but the results are pretty consistent from what I've seen and fairly encouraging. Here's the protocol uh, with heat detection and then a cleanup time to AI. <clears throat> Again, this very, the same three protocols, but we heat check for a period and then do a cleanup time to AI with all those protocols. And then the fixed time to AI protocols, the seven day co sink plus cedar. 60 to 66 hours in cows, it's different than what it was in heifers. Uh, heifers was around 54, it was earlier. And then the five-day co-sync cedar. Um, there's a lot of uh, debate about which is best. Um, you gotta, you have to run animals through, I haven't talked about the five-day protocol. GnRH cedar, remove it at five days, but you have to give two shots of prostaglandin. Um, some eight hours, six to eight hours apart, or six to ten hours apart. You, this young CL will not lice with one shot of prostaglandin, and I'll demonstrate that in another protocol with natural service here in a minute. When it's all said and done, I'm not convinced one's better than the other, and if it's worth that extra time through the shoot uh, with the five-day, I don't know that the, the research supports that, but if timing, if we need a real or fairly short protocol to, to go into cows, um, it it works well. It's interesting though, and this is from Dr. Smith in, in Missouri, that many studies done with timed AI, over 2,000 cows, <clears throat> several different citations. Of these cows, 57% were cycling, 43% were not. And at the end of the day, with the timed AI program, we're getting just as many animals that are in an asterisk pregnant as those that are cycling. And I can contest to that as well. We breed <clears throat> first calf heifers every year. We have blood samples on that are not cycling that we get pregnant with the cedar at similar rates as, uh, as this would suggest. So again, just characterizing those, you can look at that later. If we're going to heat check, and it can cheapen up some of our programs to some extent with balance with labor, we have some aids to heat check from tail paint to some of these things like the bovine beacon or the OKMAR to something that's very expensive like the heat watch system that, that monitor or measures pressure when an animal mounts and relays it to a computer. Again, just application of some of these. These Estratech patches work really well. They just peel off a card, you stick them on a cow. When they, they're like a lottery ticket, when they ride the animals, it rubs that off. And again, just activation of these different uh, different units, including chalk and KMARS or this bovine beacon we can use for to help us find animals in heat. So what we're challenged with is we go into a group of animals. We have animals that are in different stages of the ester cycle, and we also have animals in the bottom here that are anasters. And we do, <clears throat> again, have very effective protocols to get anasters animals pregnant using a progestin. Now, it's important to keep keep in mind within reason, too. And we talk about if you have a late calving animal, how, how far or how long postpartum does she have to be before she'll respond to pro, uh, progestin like a cedar? And um, I don't have a lot of experience with that, but Dave Patterson tells me if, that when they, when they um, go into a group of animals that are likely on estrus, they want them to be at least 30 days postpartum when they remove, when they remove the cedar. I guess 
more than 30, I think, would be a little better, but at least 30 days when you remove it, meaning they got to be 23 days post-calving to have a, any chance. Gave you some data at the beginning about the advantage of synchronization <clears throat> just with moving up the cows and what it does to the calves and cows and overall productivity of the cow. And you can use, you know, any of these systems with natural service. And we, this is some Colorado State data actually, just with um, synchronization with natural service, we get animals that are older and heavier at weaning. And so what protocols are there available? You can use about any of the ones that we showed, or you can, but if you're going to use the GNRH, the select sync protocol, you need to turn the bulls in at least a couple of days before prostaglandin, and you have to give that prostaglandin shot. With heifers, we've used this. I've had a lot of producers use it. Feed MGA, your normal MGA protocol, <clears throat> for 14 days, but wait at least 10 days to turn the bulls in. This estrus off MGA is subfertile, so we don't want bulls breeding breeding heifers off MGA. Wait until, and you don't have to give prostaglandin in this protocol, and I probably wouldn't, because you're not going to, uh, or you don't want to, you don't want to synchronize them that tightly as you do with uh, with the prostaglandin injection. If you got animals that aren't cycling, cows, um, the the cedar is more effective at causing an estrus animals to cycle than, than MGA, and MGA is not approved in cows. But, you know, putting the cedar in and seven days later giving a shot of prostaglandin and removing the cedar and then turning bulls in, you know, I know we can get an estrus animals pregnant with the cedar with timed AI. I believe we can move animals up with the cedar as well, so these bulls <clears throat> would uh, do the same thing, moving these animals up, but we need that progestin if we got these late calvers that aren't cycling, or young cows are, that are likely not cycling early in the breeding season. <clears throat> a real simple protocol that I've quite a bit of experience with, as do several producers I work with, but is turning the bulls in, and then five days later, everything gets a shot of prostaglandin. Now remember that five-day um, Co-sync protocol required two shots to, to cause luteolysis. Well, this won't abort these animals that were pregnant in this period. Um, <clears throat> for Keo in a 32-day breeding season, had greater than 85% pregnancy rates in three different cow herds, some work that Short did several years ago. And you get the benefit. Okay, so this is some, uh, we, we took, when originally at Goodmanson, we had a 60-day breeding season. Here's quite a few records at 95% preg rate with no synchronization. We shortened this to a 45-day with the synchronization protocol I just showed you, and we had virtually the same preg rates with a 15-day less breeding season. So we see this translate into heavier calves at weaning, and with the kind of prices we had these last year, that one shot of prostaglandin was worth about 35 bucks. So there's a lot of uh, application with, uh, with the synchronization to improve calf uniformity and, and weaning weights. We do see a lot of variation. This was a study where they looked at the different uh, uh, protocols for the cedar when it came out and look at all the noise there. And just want just want to talk about some things to consider. Um, we tend to, if we keep track, a lot of times we we'll like we can have some sire differences, and they may show themselves more with timed AI than natural service. But when we break these down, this it, it turned out this was a custom collect bull, and these were all from a, a, a major AI company. And I'm not saying all custom collect bulls are bad by any means, but when we tend to see this kind of variation, it usually is bulls that don't come from one of our major studs. Technicians, if we start keeping track of who did what, uh, we can have some differences in pregnancy rates, and again, that can lead to variation in our programs. Transportation, when we move animals after they're AI'd. Now again, remember that five-day <clears throat> protocol where we turn bulls in and give prostaglandin. We don't have a CL that's responsive to prostaglandin until, say, day six or seven, so if if we're going to stress that animal, I would say 
do it sooner rather than later. And again, this is some work from Colorado State as well. But those animals transported early at a higher synchronized pregnancy rate than those that were transported later. And so the question becomes, how long do you have to wait? They're probably not safe with calf um, until sometime after 30 days. <clears throat> I always I prefer 40 days before we before we transport them. Another thing we tend to think about our our systems of getting animals ready to breed that everything happens everything happens before breeding that ultimately affect our our conception rates. Just want to show you this to illustrate. That that's not the case. Here's some heifers <clears throat> that we have developed in on corn stalks or in a dry lot, and the gain obviously was different going into breeding. And ask which had the higher preg rates. These lighter heifers actually had higher preg rates than those that were developed in the lot. And if we start breaking this down to try to try to look at why. Well, the pre-breeding gain obviously was greater in these lauded heifers. These heifers were then AI'd and put in the same pasture, and look at their response. If they were on a lower plane of nutrition during the winter and moving up, moving up just because of this difference in response to this same environment based on how they were developed, I believe this post-breeding post nutrition can have a huge impact on our success of any synchronization and AI program. And I don't I think the worst thing to do is have a, an animal going the other way when we're trying to establish pregnancy, meaning going from a real high rate of gain in a lot that then goes to grass and is on a low rate of gain. Um, just wanted to show this slide <clears throat> where uh, just to illustrate this a little more. Here's heifers on stocks, heifers in the dry lot, and they weren't pushed really hard, but look what happens when they go to grass in the same pasture. These heifers on stocks outgain these heifers a full pound a day. So how we manage those animals post weaning can impact their response to the environment as being better or better or worse than what they were on. And that can affect pregnancy rates. So a lot of things to consider. I'm going to give you a refer you to a paper that covers a lot of these in more detail, but body condition, you know, what animals are are good candidates for synchronization. These young animals may be good candidates for a cedar. Um, how long postpartum? Can we apply these protocols successfully? How many are cycling in a herd? That's the first thing we kind of want to know. Nutrition, weather, and then the correct application of protocols, which is very important. As part of this task force, we've Iowa Beef Center developed this ester synchronization planner years ago, but our repro group has um, made a lot of recommendations, changes, so it has the most up-to-date protocol. And here's the website I'm referring to. It's just beefrepro.info. And that has the synchronization planner. And we have a deal with Iowa State now. You can go download that for free. Um, we pay them so much a year. We were providing it at our repro uh, workshops, but we, we can do it for the whole, I guess, world population for about the cost of one meeting. It's just an Excel spreadsheet, and it's just run on these tabs. And basically, you, uh, you, you start with the end in mind. When do you want to breed? What time do you want to breed? Do you want to use estrus with AI or just, just breed on heats? With, or you know the three programs I showed you, or, or to heat check and breed and then do a cleanup, or just straight timed AI. And then you pick those gives you the most preferred heifer and cow systems. You then can go and print out a calendar, which is very helpful. People know exactly what day they need to do what. There's a lot of other good information on there, too. And here's our website. Again, this is what it looks like, beefrepro.info. Go to resources. You can access those protocol sheets. You can access some other information on the ester cycle if you want to. And you can access our proceedings from our reproductive uh, uh, strategies pro, uh, programs we've had. I think they're all up on that website now. And a must read for anyone considering AI. This is a really, really useful paper that Mike Smith presented in Joplin, Keys to a Successful Ester Synchronization and in Artificial Insemination Program, written in conjunction with George Perry at, at South Dakota State. But 
really gives a lot of uh, good information on what to expect and consider and you're going to AI or, or just synchronize. Our beef website, again, I think everybody on here should be familiar with that, obviously. So um, there's also some learning modules on here with synchronization. There's a, a Raspbian and I have a, a, a pro, uh, synchronization uh, NEB guide <coughs> that's accessible through there. And with that, I don't know if there are any questions or all again, that information, a lot of what I went over, if you go to that website, you can get the protocol sheets. You can get a lot of uh, good information, including that that paper of Mike Smith. You need to go back through, uh, you go to proceedings, and then the Joplin, and then it's this one is actually on an Angus website <clears throat> that covered the meeting, and you go to newsroom. It's not real intuitive where those proceedings are when they're on that Angus website, but you go through newsroom and you can find the Joplin and and uh, Boise meeting is post posted uh, directly on our site. Any questions? Thank you for joining us today. And Thanks, Rick, for that presentation. I think that was really good. I want to remind those of you who are watching today that on April 3rd, Rick Rasby is going to talk about getting your bull ready for the breeding season, so we'll do that at 12.30 Central Time on April 3rd. Uh, this presentation today will be archived on the beef.unl.edu website, as will all other future beef webinars. If you have questions, please contact Rick. His contact information is on, on your screen there, and uh, we appreciate you joining us today.